just to sort of uh, give you a sort of an outline of what I'll be talking about. So I had decided that I would start with a sort of few quotes and comments and I put updated here uh, because of what I've heard in the last few days. I wanted to sort of throw in a, a few comments there. Um, from there, I'll move into giving a little preamble and background because, you know, uh, people come from uh, different backgrounds before I sort of present our simple network model setup and summary that sort of give an essence of how theta rhythms are generated in the hippocampus, and then linking that to sort of more detailed network models and some closing comments. Okay, so it's just an update. Um, I've really been enjoying several of the talks, and uh, for in particular, Carol uh, Goebel's uh, comments about, you know, personal burden versus public good, and, you know, the challenges associated with it, and the four points of love, fame, money, and nudge in terms of trying to change things sort of resonated with me because I remember many years ago talking to actually Sean Hill in terms of collaboration and, you know, how we can sort of move forward in that direction. And he mentioned about, well, I mean, it's really hard, you know, to sort of change human behavior, but at least you can start with tools and get people sort of on board and sort of try to use things together. And that's great. So it's really been rewarding and exciting seeing all the developments in the field and also facing up to the challenges in terms of sort of um, what this encompasses in terms of human interactions. So I really appreciated hearing about that. And then also uh, very interesting hearing about sort of the uh, programs and the training ideas in terms of neuroinformatics, computational neuroscience aspects, and really the heterogeneity associated with it. And so, of course, there's only 24 hours in a day. So, you know, as much as we'd like to do everything, we, of course, have to choose our, our foci. And um, in my case, um, Oops, is that the right thing? Yeah. Um, so just, just in an in a overview in terms of where I see myself as sort of trying to sort of develop bridges. And so what I feel very strongly about um, coming out of high school, I actually wanted to be a veterinarian and I ended up going into mathematics because I've always loved math and sort of coming back and now being in sort of uh, in, in between fields and I don't really know what I am except I'm in neuroscience. And so this is what I feel really strongly about is sort of this cycling, this collaborative cycling towards conversions and translations. So in terms of the models, so we focus on biophysical and microcircuit type models, uh, detailed models, and trying to sort of, of course, interface with experimental data as we all do, but of course there's challenges associated with that, but really it's about this cycling that has to happen. And so to me, that's what it's all about. And move into my first quote, which several years ago I was invited to be part of the eLife um, board, and I was very happy about that because I think this is one of the big challenges in terms of what we have to overcome. And this is a quote from one of Eve's many interesting essays, if, if you guys haven't read this. This is an older one from 2006 that I had, I have pinned up on my board in my office because I think this is really important, um, even present day, of course, is that the where you publish matters more about what you're actually trying to say, and this is a terrible message, especially for young scientists. So I feel very strongly about this, not only for my own students, because now I have a daughter who's starting her PhD and sort of, you know, facing these challenges, and you have all that sort of passion and excitement of people doing science, you don't want it to get crushed for reasons that are not what they're supposed to be. So eLife is a fantastic enterprise. Um, they're very, in my opinion, of, of dealing with um, being, uh, being a reviewing editor for a couple of years now and seeing sort of the openness, the discussion, the evolving, you know, of course it's a bunch of, you know, it's not, nothing's perfect, right, but it's really trying to change the culture of peer review and um, this is so important because, you know, this is essentially what sort of pervades everything in terms of human interaction. And so the second quote I wanted to take was from this excellent perspective that I read not too long ago. It just came out this year, The Scientific Case for Brain Simulation. So it's a really nice article. I'm sure you guys have all read it, um, but it really lays down very nicely sort of the, the different simulations, model simulators and all the rest of it. But one of the things that it says, one of the quotes from it that I've taken is making the point that the mechanistic modeling is still in its infancy. and. Um, and, and that allows me to sort of make this point about this clear and growing overlap, if you like, between computational neuroscience and neuroinformatics. Of course, how exactly people want to define computational neuroinformatics may vary, but you know, uh, by and large, computational neuroscience is maybe more about focused on the development of the mathematical models that you want to apply and use to try to understand the function of the system and all the rest of it, whereas the neuroinformatics is maybe more focused on the tools and algorithms that one is developing. But clearly, when we develop these models, you need the data, or while you're developing, after developing, at different stages, that comes from 
that is clearly has to come from very nice analysis of, in, of people developing those tools in the neuroinformatic field. And of course, how you analyze the data is influenced by how the models might be telling you how the system is working. So there's an obvious overlap. So that quote takes me to the next quote that I, I, I really enjoyed reading even though it was some years ago and I think it was said in one of the earlier talks too about sort of you know this is this piecemeal approach it's not clear how we're going to get there in terms of understanding you know brain workings and you know how it's going to help us with neurological disease and the rest and um, in this commentary by Anne Churchland and Larry and Larry said he was specifically responsible for this last statement is that global understanding when it comes will likely take the form of highly diverse panels loosely stitched together in a patchwork quilt and I just I just sort of love that because that to me is what it's about we don't know what is the best approach we don't know what is the best model we don't know I mean we just have to try and we have to try together and sort of patch it together so this sort of openness and clarity, which is what uh, INCF is all about, is I feel very strongly about. Um, but exactly how we do that and get about it is, you know, work in progress. So um, the other quote is from an editorial that was part of in the earlier stages about theory, models, and biology. And this was an editorial in eLife that was uh, nice to be a part of. And one of the statements that was made in here is that despite the rich history with the theory, biology, and models, is that there seems to be a divide that sort of persists. And you know, I'm talking specifically about neuroscience and many reasons for that. But I think one of the aspects that can certainly be improved is really being clear. Um, and that's why I sort of put that in the title. It's for many different reasons. But you know, when we build models, right? When we do a model of the hippocampus, not only the one microcircuit, but it's built for different reasons. The goal of the model is not always the same, and that's fine, right? I mean, we want that, but that should be clearly stated so that people looking at these different models realize that when you build on it, what the rationale, what the challenges, what the assumptions that went into it, how the parameters were chosen, what were the justifications, and all the rest of it. So those things, even though they are there, to a certain extent, in some papers, it really needs to be upfront much more because then it's hard to build this patchwork quilt. Okay, so the next quote is uh, from Eve again, and even though this is a couple of years old, I think it's uh, I think points to something that uh, I feel strongly about also, and this gets into you know this collaborative view is that understanding brains, and so we're in the era of big data. Clearly, we have been for some time. <coughs> In order to get there, we have to, of course, collaborate and work together. And so she talks in this essay about being a very exciting times because of all the sophisticated tools and, and methods that we have, but also trepidation because of you know, someone using a tool as a black box and you know, garbage in, garbage out, for example. So it's really hard because there's, cha there's sophistication at all levels of experiment, mathematical modeling, computation, you know, everything. So signal analysis, we you know, heard the talk this morning, it was like fantastic, but you know, I certainly don't understand all the mathematical details in, in the, the tensor, even though I know a little bit about tensors. So really, paradoxically, the future is about developing stronger quantitative understanding in the experimental community, as well as better biological intuition in the theory community. It just makes it easier for people to come together. And so this quote is from a while ago, but I, this quote really struck me back in 2000 when I read this in the Nature Neuroscience Supplement, is that because science starts with human interaction, so if we want this sort of interaction collaboration, and this is something we, you know, we heard about, I mean, that's why Carol Goebbels talk really resonated with me, certain things she was saying is that we have to leave our prejudices at the door. And we have to, um, and this is where sociological forces have to be tamed. And so, so that quote from Gilles Laurent in, in that article is sort of in with my own quote, um, of something I wrote because that is what sort of, I, I was invited to write this some years ago, but um, really to have the synergy, we really have to have more regular discussions and interactions, but at early stage, it's not sort of, oh, I have some experimental data, could you model it? Oh, I have you know, idea, could you do this experiment? We sort of be talking at earlier stages. Um, between individual theorists, individual experts, individual everybody, but this takes a lot of time and of course open-mindedness because we have to sort of recognize each other's hard work and that's hard to do. I mean, if you don't code, like if you're an experimentalist, you know, it's not that straightforward to throw together MATLAB code because there's certain things associated with it. And similarly, if you're not doing the experiments, you know, to realize how hard it was to actually get that recording. I mean, these sort of things really have to sort of be appreciated. Um, to sort of work together and asking lots of critical questions with mutual respect. 
you should ask questions. You don't, you don't know anything. I don't. I mean, I didn't know anything about you know hippocampal detail interneurons many years ago. But you know, you keep asking questions, stupid questions. But if you don't ask, you don't know. And so, similarly, the explanators should be asking the models those critical questions of why the heck are you using this kind of models? It's not. You know, like these are the things that should be upfront early on. So, that's the end of my quotes. And so. Um, and comments. Anybody want to throw things at me or <laughs> it's uh, stuff? But I mean, <laughs> it's really about the human interaction. It's my take home message. And you know, in terms of individual people and being open minded, critical question, and listening to each other. And so, in terms of how the brain works, I think it's clear to say, um, you know, well, so or what kind of neural code. And it's clear that neural oscillations have, you know, something to do with this. And we've known since back in 1929 when Hans Bezier measured uh, oscillations, rhythmic activity at the brain. And of course, we've known that Bob Marley taught us all about rhythm. I grew up in the West Indies, and so this is the kind of music I love. And um, once we talk about neuron oscillations, we have to talk about inhibitory cells, inhibitory networks, and interneurons, because this is sort of what seem to be the controllers of the generations of these rhythms. And this is just one particular inhibitory cell, the Orion's lacuna molecular uh, interneuron in the hippocampus CA1. These are just examples of papers, uh, uh, some more recent than others. Uh, pointing out brain oscillations and function in terms of, you know, I think it's fair to say they're probably not an epiphenomenon because we see sort of this high gamma frequency oscillation with working memory, theta enhancement and, and um, retrieval in phase specific ways, uh, temporal lobe and neocortical interactions with memory and ripple oscillations, and theta oscillations in particular, um, as probably most people know, has been studied in the hippocampus for a long time and they're very, probably the most robust rhythm there. And we have this very clear phase code in terms of the phase precession of the spiking as the animal moves through space. And so I think it's pretty fair to think about um, phase code. It's pretty clear that there's some kind of phase coding where the oscillatory cycle is like a functional unit. And this has been said by many authors. And uh, indeed it was back in 2002 that my Castleman and colleagues sort of, you know, came up with this suggestion about encoding and retrieval in the peak and the trough. And in the previous paper that I just cited, this is exactly what they showed, is that if you stimulate um, at different phases in the cycle, you get an enhancement of the retrieval and encoding. So all of this is to sort of tell you that you should care about theta oscillations. They're really important. And a lot of people have studied it and are studying it continually. And we also know that, so that's in rodents that I was talking about. It's also clear that we have them in, in humans. And the difference is, so even though, and there seem to be functional similarities associated with the theta rhythm, but except they seem to occur in intermittent bouts. So this is something to keep in mind. But the, the idea is how are these theta rhythms generated? And so the being clear and open part um, that I put in my title is because, first of all, when you say theta rhythms, a theta rhythm is a theta rhythm. It's not a homogeneous rhythm. There's many different types of theta rhythms. So in this very old, um, and I apologize for people who probably here who know more about theta rhythms than myself, um, that 2002, uh, Buzaki, one of this uh, reviews on theta oscillations, just showing that, you know, when you have, so this is in the intact brain recording, and you see the sinks and sources uh, giving you this sort of this theta rhythm. And if you sort of lesion the enterocortical cortex, you still have this ongoing theta rhythm, but of course it's now not, not coming from the region where the enterocortical cortex uh, comes into the um, hippocampus, but you still have this ongoing rhythm. So there's sort of clearly two different ways in which the th uh, theta rhythms are sort of generated or they come about. Um, and then this is just to show you when you sort of stick an electrode down um, into the, this, in this case, the mouse, that you see there's different features associated with this ongoing theta rhythm. You have the gamma uh, on top, so you have these theta gamma rhythms, but you have polarity differences depending on where you're recording from and features and all the rest of it. The theta rhythms also are, so they come in type one, type two, that are associated with social or fearful stimuli, so ventral dorsal differences. And so there's a lot of people studying um, the theta rhythms of studying hippocampus, and there's a lot of information known. And clearly, we have to sort of be very clear about when we're talking about theta rhythms, what we're referring to. And of course, that means you know reading a lot and interacting with people. What we also know is there's an intrahippocampal theta rhythm. And so this was uh, from 2009 uh, from Sylvan Williams' lab that showed that you can generate a theta rhythm in an in vitro whole hippocampus preparation. And so um, this is shown here what it looks like in a behaving animal and when they sort of take it out and stick it in a dish. So there's a lot of details associated with it. It's an atropine insensitive one. And <clears throat> that's another sort of difference between the two. 
So, but suffice it to say, is even though there's many different ways to send a generated data, we do not have a sense of how it's actually generated, where is this coming from? And so this is where so the models could be very helpful. But of course, once you think about this, so this is the local circuit is um, interneurons, inhibitory cells. So as I think probably everybody knows, there's a very heterogeneous uh, group of cell types, inhibitory cells. We can't just sort of think of them as inhibitory and excitatory cells, as inhibitory cells of many different types. And in this now pretty old review, um, this is schematized showing that the three different types of inhibitory cells, basket cells, OLM cells, and axoxonic or chandelier cells, fire in phase specific ways in this sort of ongoing theta rhythm. And then this is a sharp wave ripple. This is the pyramidal cell. So there's again, seems to be sort of controlling different ways of different inhibitory cell types. And of course, models have been built of them. Of course, there's a lot of detail in terms of morphology, connectivity differences, what they stand for and the intrinsic properties. And in this paper that just came out this year, we have now 49 fine clusters of different inhibitor cell types. So um, lots of excite, and this is coming from the single cell transcriptomics. So it's very exciting times because we can really get a handle on these different inhibitory cell types. But of course, this makes it more challenging to sort of try to understand how this sort of complex interaction gives rise to these theta rhythms. And um, I like this quote from Buzaki because it was back in 2006 where, you know, we, we really can't just, you know, when we think of these models, just think of inhibitory cells and excitatory cells. We really have to think about, you know, what inhibitory cell type we're talking about. But of course, that really raises challenges. So my mantra for many years now has been neither ignore the details nor be consumed by them. So really when we're ta thinking about these brain networks, you know, the context and the function that you're specifically thinking about the size, the network size and its particular architecture, connectivity and cellular characteristics are all gonna contribute in sort of different ways depending on the specifics. And so how they were generated. So. Let me just, at this point, put up the acknowledgement. So in case I run out of time, I don't have to rush through um, the, you know, the people who are responsible for the work in different details. And so I'd like to acknowledge all present and past lab members and collaborators because it's a lot of discussion that goes on and you know, different ideas and details. But for what I will show you specifically, Alexandra, Katie, Scott, Anton, and Melissa, I'm showing parts of, of what work they've done um, in a sort of summarized way, but I always ask me lots of questions. And from the collaborative uh, perspective, so Sylvan Williams lab, of course. Um, so Kerry Hugh was a PhD student in the uh, lab at the time we did the recordings. Um, mathematicians Sue Ann and Wilton and now Jeremy in present in terms of sort of uh, discussions and I'm not showing all the details of the work but a lot of that theoretical mean field analysis sort of allowed us to sort of come to terms with where we're situating the model and of course funding sources and support in the institute. Um, okay, so basically, uh, because of this whole hippocampus preparation, where you sort of have this spontaneous rhythm, suffice it to say, I'm sorry with the assumption that this is sort of uh, meaningful, this is uh, uh, something that can be discussed, of course, but we have this ongoing oscillation. So that means it's an opportunity, at least the way I saw it was an opportunity to really build these microcirc models to have this kind of uh, model experimental interaction to really sort of see if we can get the models to capture um, in an ongoing interactive way what was going on and how the theta rhythms were generated. Because I don't have to tell this audience, you know, this uh, sketch which is sort of based off uh, uh, the classic Shepard um, sort of multi-scale, multi-dimensional ways you have to think about the nervous system. And so if you want to think about these different levels, you have to, you know, think about your models in that context and what assumptions you're meeting, making. So we're in a cellular-based microcircuit um, level. And so what we did, so this part is published, so I'll go through it relatively fast, but it's important for me to sort of tell you about it. So the later part, which is unpublished, you sort of hopefully could appreciate. Um, and if not, just ask me questions. So because of this situation, we use this strategy where we took advantage of this experimental context of this intrinsic um, ongoing theta CA1 rhythm um, from Sylvan Williams lab in this whole hippocampus prep. We developed our mathematical models in that context and leveraged sort of theoretical insights associated with how they were producing their sort of a coherent output and did experiment extensive uh, parameter variation analysis, which is of course lots of computation. And so um, this allowed this kind of interaction. There's reasons these are dotted or dash, which I won't get into right now unless somebody wants to ask me, but it's sort of this ongoing you know, reasons why you're making certain choices for certain models and certain parameters, and um, I'm happy to talk about this ad nauseum, um, but I won't right now. Um, so suffice it to say the models we developed um, that, that Katie was responsible for developing 
had to do with PV, so fast-firing inhibitory cell types and networks of them, pyramidal cells and excitatory cells and networks of them, and then sort of putting them together. Um, what I'll, sh I'll show you at a later, but essentially, in a nutshell, the equations, the cellular equations that we used were of an Isakievich type, so a second order and discontinuous type, and there was a reason for going that way too, as opposed to starting with a biophysical type model, which again, I could talk about ad nauseum. We didn't start off knowing this, but it was sort of this sort of ongoing interaction with Sylvan Williams' lab and, you know, us going there and talking and what exactly we could expect from the experimental data and choices that were made along the way. So this is about this sort of very open, so Sylvan Williams' lab, he's a fantastic guy and, you know, very open, asks lots of silly questions and all the rest of it, but, you know, that helps you make your decisions about developing these models. So what we would want the models to sort of capture, which is known from the experimental data, and so this is from the lab, um, the experimental recordings in this whole hippocampus prep. So you have this ongoing um, theta oscillation, and then this is a simul simultaneous recording of, in this case, a pyramidal cell, and you see it's not firing every time, and not every pyramidal cell, approximately 20% fire. So this one, for example, is not firing, but it's not that it's sick or dead, because, you know, you hypopolarize it, it can, it can spike. So you have the sparse firing of the pyramidal cells. So this is an advantage of, of course, an in vitro preparation, right? You can get these simultaneous recordings of ongoing activity and well as sort of different cell types. And so this is, of course, what they took advantage of. Of course, you could do um, pharmacological manipulations more easily than in vivo and the rest of it. But the other information that we have from this situation is the ratio of excited inhibitory currents on the pyramidal cells and the PV positive cells as well as the somatostatin positive cells. So this is all information that is important to sort of figure out where that balance is um, from the model perspective. So as I said, um, this, this was published already, but to make the point of neither ignoring the details nor being consumed by them is we decided that we would stick with just two cell types. Although PV positive cells may be encompassed by stratified cells, axoxonic cells, um, and basket cells. So, but this is sort of what the experimental data, they were sort of uh, targeting PV positive cells because that's what they were able to do. And so, um, because we knew from their work of, of Benedict that the, it was the PV positive cells that were important in sort of having this rhythm in the first place, because if you silence them, you um, would lose a rhythm, whereas that wasn't true for the somatostatin. So this is just uh, to quickly show that. So what they had is that here's the sort of ongoing rhythm, if you silence the somatostatin cells here optogenetically, you basically don't lose it, whereas with the PV cells, you would lose it or basically, you know, shut it down a lot more. So there's other details in here, but from this we felt comfortable to start off with sort of the simple network model, just had the two. And as I mentioned, it was an Isakievich style model that we chose to use because of um, the fitting of the parameters were based directly on recordings from this preparation, of course, blocking synaptic uh, inputs to get the ABD different parameters that are in the Isakievich model. And this is just showing an example of, of what it looks like. And in the network, um, the size of the network, 510,000, and the particular connectivity is again what was sort of known in the literature. And um, I'll get into the size a little bit more when I get to the detailed model, but also we had um, other inputs, sort of noisy input coming into the sort of system, sort of representing maybe afferents from entorhinal cortex A3, because when you cut it or when you have it, it's not like they're not sort of contributing anything. <coughs> So, um, as I said, this is, this is out there. So basically to say that when we have just excitatory network problem alone, it is literally impossible to get the sparse firing. So, but when you put in sort of the PV cells, you can get the sparse firing and maintain this population rhythm. So this balance of where we're sitting to get, get theta frequency population rhythm sort of came out of uh, mean field analysis that was done in terms of the whole system so we kind of knew where we should situate things. Um, again, that's published, I'm not going to get into that. And this is just sort of the RAS plot. This is the 10,000 parameter cells at the top and the 500 PV cells at the bottom. And in a summary of, of, of the take-home message, the network size and the inhibitory cellular models were based on that preparation in terms of, you know, what you know, what they're exactly doing, and then we took advantage of theoretical, what is known in terms of producing coherent output. So for example, the PV network is sort of the ing mechanism, so like Paul, for example, who's an expert on those kind of analysis in terms of producing this sort of current output 
was there. So that situated where those parameter values needed to be in the parameter cell network on its own, had some five-second adaptation to get sort of a theta burst type frequency out. And so basically, and then we, we were able to get this theta rhythm in this sparse, sparse firing of the excitatory cells, suggesting that maybe we're capturing some mechanistic es essence of this theta rhythm. Um, so therefore, because of what we have in the model, spike between adaptation, post infinity rebound in these large minimally connected networks. So this is a CA1 is minimal, less than 1% connection between the parameter cells. But in order to match experimental data, yes, we would get that, but it was also uh, required that you had to have a larger PV to parameter cell rather than a parameter PV cell connectivity. Otherwise, you wouldn't actually match the appropriately excited or inhibitory current balances that were in the experimental data. So it's important because I'll come back to that when we sort of make this sort of link. So okay, we have that, so as I mentioned, that's published already. Um, but we wanted to sort of get a better handle on, well, is this really sort of the uh, robust mechanism that could be going on in the model that hopefully is representing the biological situation? So um, together with um, and Jeremy, we had a student, Anton, who created this E-cell model, excitatory parameter cell model, model database. And so we did that so we could sort of create um, many E-cell models. So there's 10,000 I mentioned, but preserve the spike metrics of that, which, that where you have the rhythm. And so basically we just changed those um, parameters, created a large database, and this is simply to show that so long as you preserve the metric, and we just took very simple ways of preserving the spike frequency adaptation, post and rebound, real based metrics of where it's sitting, like in terms of assessing it in the different models. And suffice it to say is that you, you know, you still have it. So this is just say when all the excitatory cells are sort of the same, but they're different, of course, because it's getting this noisy input. But now they're all different here, but they have the same metrics, and you still have this sort of rate. Of course, it's not going to be identical. But what we found in this process that it was the adaptation part was less critical. Really, it was about the post inhibitory rebound and where that rear base. So that's where so that balance, critical balance was. And so this is now just sort of four examples of just the excitatory output. Of course, the inhibitory uh, metro, um, cell is there to say that where is this third frequency burst coming from in this EI network? Um, it's essentially emerging because of the net input to the parameter cell population so long as you have this balanced excitatory inhibitor input. And so you, you, I, I, the way it is situated came from those previous models. So I have to get into details associated with that, but we situated it close to sort of the edge so that we knew it would have current output in the eye cell. And so that allowed, that made sense to allow us to look at this from a phase response curve analysis to really get a handle on maybe how these rhythms are coming out, what's controlling it. So what I can safely say now based on Scott doing many phase response curves is that the inhibitory input bolus is tuning. So long as you have the balanced excitatory inhibitory input, you can sort of tune it to get the state of population output. And this is just showing you an example. So the top here is just showing you 2,000 of the 10,000, and you can see the frequency is faster here. So this is a network. On the bottom here is the distribution from all those A, B uh, networks that we're having there. And now what I'm showing here is phase response curves, and probably everybody knows what phase response curve, but basically negative here means a delay, and the positive is an advance for the inhibitory bolus coming in. And so this is just showing for this excitatory cell versus this excitatory cell, which is uh, taken from values in these distributions, you have a much larger amplitude of the delay so that would, you'd think you'd slow down the excitatory cell, and yes, you do, but you're sort of advancing and slowing it down here. But if you look at the net frequency because of the different intrinsic properties of the excitatory cell, here it's, say, 8.6, and here it's 40. Now, I'm choosing these I values to be appropriate to where they're actually getting in the system. And so basically, there's a frequency that the excitatory cells can fire at for the net input it's getting, and the inhibitory bullet sort of timing it and tuning it. So this is what that is showing, and to sort of bring about that sort of balance aspect, this is just a, another ask, another example here. So here it's slower, but you can see that it's kind of losing it. So you kind of need to have this, this balance. So again, if you look at the PRCs, um, the phase response curve, so the hair, this is sort of slowing things down a bit, but the frequencies are not as different as the previous slide that I showed you, and this is actually a slower rhythm network, but it's almost been lost. So in other words, this balance of the EI is sort of close to being lost, by virtue of the different parameter values in the E-cell network, which is now required to drive the I-cells. So all of this, um, I think, makes me comfortable, and I mean, I'm just showing you a snapshot, of course, that the, the mechanism, sort of the generation mechanism in these simple models, which are um, 
hopefully presumably representative of what's going on into the intact preparation, is emerging because of this net input to the promised cell population with its particular intrinsic characteristics as captured by the ABD kilo in the Isakivish model with this balanced exciter inhibitory coupling in order to have it in that state. So that's nice, it's a simple model, so I feel sort of very excited about that, but it's hard to sort of feedback directly to sort of experimental to work when you have the model at that level. So yes, it's representing PV fast firing cells, we know, and it was based on those, but of course there's 59 different inhibitory cells, right, in the CA1, and so it's not about trying to put them all in at the start, but what was really nice was there was a, another model of a full-scale CA1 circuit that was developed in Ivan Schultz's lab, and this was a heroic tour de force study in many ways. It was based off of assessing all that was known in the literature from their own experiments and other experiments of CA1 circuits, cellular properties, connection properties, synaptic properties, you know, many different ones, and it's all gathered together as a table, everybody, anybody can go and access it. So that's, that was there in this 2013 publication, and then Marianne and colleagues have put it all together in this model, and got theta rhythms. And what Yvonne says is that because it only, okay, so it has eight different types of inhibitory cells and the promised cell population, 300,000 plus, so it's representing the actual size of the CA1 uh, microcircuit, and probably some people know that there's a more detailed one that will hopefully come online soon from a uh, human brain project, and um, it produces theta rhythms. So as Yvonne said, like you said, wow, this, they just produced that kind of stuff. Now, of course, there's all the details complexity going on in the set of differential equations. These are multi-compartment models. You know, they have sodium, potassium, all the details associated with it. They're still relatively simplified to, um, you know, so the parameter cell in this case is very detailed, but some of the inhibitory cells, even though they're multi-compartment, they're still not super detailed. But it produces this, this theta rhythm. Um, and because it's actually just a CA1, this is sort of loose, I, would, I, I call it loosely based on the whole hippocampus prep, because again, you have this intrahippocampal theta rhythm. So this, in some sense, I thought was an opportunity, because now we could think of this sort of overlap between the detailed and simple models, okay? All both have advantages and disadvantages in different ways. So in order to do this, um, so what I, I maybe didn't say directly is when we did our simple models, when Katie had put this model together some years ago based on many aspects, we made the choice, so we're thinking about size, and so we intentionally created a um, one cubic millimeter is what the estimate we did, and we felt justified to do that because of the experimental work that said if you use proclane and you block in certain parts, that you, can, you would still get the oscillations. In other words, you don't need the entire uh, hippocampus, it's just a, a, a piece there, so we sort of focused on that so we could think about cell numbers in a, a particular way, and actually that's about 30,000, but as you would have seen, there was 10,000, but the 10,000 we took advantage of because of invariance in the mean field analysis model. So basically, in order to now make this comparison, we have to take a chunk of the detailed model. So the detailed model is 300,000, so we're going to take a chunk of it. So this is a very large scale model, high dimensional, and so you just take a chunk, it's not like you just, you just get it, right? So in terms of trying to sort of understand what's going on, the first thing is, you know, is it valid to sort of even think about this? So one of the first things we did, and this was uh, Melissa, was to compare the connectivities. Um, so in our model, we just had random connectivities, you know, 1% or less than 1% for this connection, 12% was sort of based on what's reasonable known, known about the connectivity, and then we had um, different values there that we explored. <coughs> in the Bezier model, there are these empirical, empirical numbers that were based on their um, um, intense work in terms of knowing what was connected to what, where the dendrites and all the rest of it. Okay, good, because I'm, I'm close to being dead. Um, five minutes of talking or five minutes of, yeah, okay. So <laughs> that's no problem. So basically, um, in a long story short, what Melissa did was she sort of went into the detailed model, and again, everything's open and accessible, so it's important to you know, be able to do that. I mean, there's that's some of you technical issues, but basically uh, from that, she was able to extract, and what was really nice is that what we had found in the simple model that I had mentioned before was that in order to be consistent with experimental work, you had to have the PV to parameter rather than the parameter to PV larger, that's exactly what the empirical was there. So it, it sort of felt good, it was consistent, made sense, so we can make this comparison. So we went ahead and did that. So in a nutshell, what we did was we took the guidance from the simple model, so we did a comparison of the synaptic weights, which led us to focus more on excitatory connections. And so Alexandra, um, you know, once she kind of got this working, she was able to generate these theta rhythms in this chunk very nicely, but in different ways. And I think that's what's important. So a couple of things, one, 
The fact that you have a smaller network, so 30,000 rather than 300,000, means you can do many, many simulations, which is what you want to do to be able to sort of explore the parameter space. So that's what, of course, they didn't do, but because it was, it was huge, right? So there they did a few perturbations. So in doing this exploration, in the particular way of focusing on the excitatory connection, so the x-axis here is the parameter parameter connections, and the y-axis here is the inputs, sort of, if you like, the noisy input, the enteronic cortex, CA3, into the parameter cell population. That's what that's representing, that's what she's exploring, because that's what the simple model said of where the focus needed to be in terms of getting this sort of theta rhythm that we had here. So this is the, nor the theta power, normalized theta power, frequency, and the amount of that stimulation that needed, the stimulation that needed to come in to, make, to get that theta rhythm. And so this is circled here, and she calls it high and low, just to show you get this theta rhythm, but it's in two different ways, and this is nicely shown when you sort of start blocking things. So this is just now showing the low. Um, so the spectrogram, so this is the raw LFP output, this is the theta filtered and the theta gamma filtered, um, and here's a, um, you see the oscillation there when you do sort of the uh, FFT. Um, if you now remove the PV cells, as I mentioned, the PV cells was an important renew from the external to bring, bring this about, you see that you basically get a huge reduction in sort of the slower theta rhythm and actually get this, uh, a larger gamma rhythm there, and this is sort of what the raw LFP looks like in this case when you block it. So, so this is, so, you know, there's many details of what you could look at in different cellular output. This is to make the point that the low and the high, so that both of them produce in theta rhythm, but when you block the PV, you get a very different response in terms of what kind of rhythms comes out. So in other words, the mechanism of sort of the different pathways, the self-specific pathways that are producing these rhythms are very different, okay? And so in terms of what's happening in the biological system, this now gives us sort of a, a way to sort of tackle that more directly in a cell-specific way, even though it only has eight types of inhibitory cells, but again, hopefully that's sort of enough to sort of capture the biological complexity. And then this is now just showing if you get rid of the parameter parameter connections, you sort of lose it. So I'm almost on my last slide, where I close it. Oh, so basically this is, I put this up here to remind myself to say that it's a simple model guidance to the detailed models of how to export and what we could sort of get away with. And I, and I, to me it was very exciting when Alexander sort of was able to produce this in different ways and that you can see these differences from the different inhibitory cell types because that's now what we could sort of more directly map onto the biological um, preparation and hopefully move forward from there. So my closing comment is, um, I actually didn't put this, but this is from uh, a schematic that I made for my 2012, um, a little, little review that I wrote, and you know, really about trying to have these two-way arrows everywhere, and this gets back into the whole human interaction part that I talked about, but really it's always a balance, right? So we started off with these simple models, but not because we want to do simple models, there was reasons associated with the experimental data when he developed the model in terms of what would sense, what we could get out, and what we could see. And then limitations computational-wise, if you want to do hundreds and thousands of simulations as large detail method to really explore the parameter space and see where things are and how to, how to explore it. And this is coming from the theoretical analysis theory and the analysis to look at it. And so this could only come to being, I mean, we're not there yet, but this is what where, where I like to try to be, is without having sort of clarity about the modeling, the experimental data, the computation, um, and being open and clear and asking lots of critical questions of each other. And so that's the end uh, for now, and Thank I already much. had my acknowledgments. Okay. Thank you, Francis. I guess uh, I'm, I'm sorry if the question is not directly on your talk. Uh, that's okay. That's, that's actually not my uh, expertise in the, this area of, uh, of uh, but um, I was, I mean, always a bit wondering what what are the uh, the standards and the tools that are you think are missing in in for you to be productive and you to uh, uh, assemble and, and and link all those those results and uh, is there and. What, what would be the, 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 the thing that you would hope to, the, the field would be developed such that you'd be much more productive in, in that kind of mm -hmm. line of work? Mm -hmm. Well, for example, electrophysiological data, um, if it could be more standardized, and I know, of course, there's uh, NWB um, efforts in that way, um, but all the metadata that goes with any of these sort of experimental situations, because you know we have these direct conversations going on with collaborators, and it takes a lot of time, and, and that's fine. You learn a lot in the process, right? But 
you know, it's a huge effort for them, you know, so they're giving us the data, we're discussing, we're asking some data, give, oh, okay, oh yeah, and the drug potential is that, we can calculate this, and we, you know, so there's a lot of ongoing conversation which probably could be reduced if there was sort of a standardized way that people sort of, you know, had the electrophysiological data with all the metadata, right, associated with it. But that is a huge effort, right, for experimentalists. And, and the same on the modeling side, they should really, you know, besides, it's not just having your model parameters, but having the experimental data that you use to decide why you use certain parameter data, parameters in your model, yeah. Do you envisage a time when, if that standardization is good enough, like uh, uh, computers could actually analyze data directly without your uh, sort of in, uh, human interface? Well, that, that would be nice, but I don't think it's a matter of sort of getting rid of the human interaction. I think you always have to have the human interaction at early stages, right? Because it's more sort of defining sort of the questions and how you're going to go about it, right? So, I mean, and I didn't talk about it today, but instead of other modeling studies with the internal specific, one of these uh, inhibitory VIP positive cell models that we developed uh, together with Lisa Topolnik's lab, there's a lot of conversation in the beginning of what she was thinking she could have it, what I said was potentially possible, given what we know, and there's a lot of this going back and forth. So, so that wasn't about the experimental data, it was about having initial conversations and that's why um, I think the earlier the conversations go on so that you're at least on the same wavelength of what it is you think you're trying to do and what you think is actually possible based on, you know, what I know about modeling, what they know about experiment, what is possible, what is expensive and, you know, everything there. So it was not a matter of getting rid of it, but you can certainly reduce the amount of, I would say, grunt work that, you know, students, postdocs, you know, other people have to do to sort of be able to share the data and the specifics associated with them. Yeah, so I, I, that would be wonderful. Do we have another question? I just have one comment. Oh, yeah. I mean, actually, I like very much your, your observation about, I mean, it's, it's obvious that we should talk, I mean, the theoreticians and the experimentalists, but very often, you know, even if it happens, it takes part very late in the whole process. I mean, so we have come several times across the situation mm -hmm. that experimental colleagues come to us and they say, oh, you know, we have those yeah. very nice experimental data. Can you help us understand them? And we yeah. say, yeah, yeah. We would actually do much more, you know, if you do, do this and yes, this, you absolutely. know, two years ago and you were starting the grant, right? Yeah, yeah. And now, of course, the whole work has been done, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, like, that's, that's, I, I, that is so important. And so this is like the next step in just... Yeah, talking early and so like having these interactions. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, you know, I've had that happen to me with, you know, other people before, but, you know, that's not going to happen unless we talk earlier. Okay, so...